So first of all, uh, it's completely uh, an honor, Grace, uh, to talk with you. And uh, uh, when we spoke to uh, your uh, student as a mentor, he spoke a lot about you. Uh, oh. We were really, really excited in terms of your contribution, uh, in terms of the work that you have done for uh, Nokia, Microsoft. And I think those are legendary milestones, I must say that. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for accepting this podcast invitation and and having had this completely an honor to speak to you today. So we, we, we are designers. We see a bunch of young, crazy people trying to do designs in a different way. Uh, so uh, it's been five years to uh, be in this industry, almost touch every industry, in, uh, uh, having had offices in uh, US, Vietnam, uh, Bangladesh, completely Asia, Asia Pacific, and we do 20,000 stores a year, plus wow. uh, 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 we do uh, work with a lot of different sector of clients, and the way they work uh, is 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 they, they come up to us, I'm ex-Samsung by the way. Uh, I was heading Samsung India retail in the uh, in the in the in the in the uh, deployment of retail side. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the moment I got into Samsung, the first thing they tell me that look, you are touching fire. Designing phones is not easy. Selling phones is not easy. Displaying phones is not easy, and uh, all 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 that uh, jazz about it. So just uh, for the common understanding, there are a lot of people sitting in this room to uh, hear you and listen to you and probably benefit you for the. Uh, for the uh, understanding of everyone, are you just putting your introduction across uh, to the team? Uh, so, as a team here, uh, we have uh, we have Grace today on this podcast, and uh, she's been uh, one of the forces, uh, I would say, uh, literally the positive forces uh, when we talk about in terms of design, right from uh, you know Microsoft to Nokia. Her collaborations have been uh, gone to awards like I have gold award. So uh, we are here to talk to Grace today and to understand what is that, you know, uh, Grace that probably, uh, you know, made you reach to this journey and how uh, do you think things are happening now in future? Yeah. Yeah, I think what is interesting as well is to be brave and try out things. So I actually started in the fashion industry and worked with H&M for many years as well and, and was going from there into technology. Uh, because you could see in all of these industries that it have huge effect on us as human beings. So color have that profound psychological influence on humans' emotions and behaviors. And uh, color can really be used to evoke these customers' behavior in many different ways. And uh, as my experience been doing that in the technology area, I mean, first of all, in fashion, for sure, where you have a very speedy relationship to color where you think that Kale could go out on date even, which is an interesting idea. Um, and then you go into the technology area and from that also going into the digital space and to understand that what that means to us. In this side of the world, uh, when we look at colors uh, in the Indian context and probably mm -hmm. I would say in Asian context, uh, I think one fascinating thing that we have been observing for quite some time is Scandinavian designs. And since we, we got to know that you're from Sweden originally. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, and so I'm back in Sweden now, actually, <laughs> living abroad for a long yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, can you have some thought line before I go to my pick up my uh, understanding on the kit? Do you have some broad, because people have understanding of Scandinavian designs and a whole different context that they talk about. Uh, can you hear something on the Scandinavian designs per se uh, from your side, the way you see it? I think, first of all, it's very democratic. And um, especially the companies I worked with as H&M, you know, fashion is democratic. Everybody should afford, have good design. And I think the Nokia and that whole world also have the similar idea. People should be connected. It doesn't matter where you come from. We we were interesting to do design that actually would be in anyone's hand, uh, not depending on if that person have a lot of money or not. You you designing to to that person's um, 
well-being, so to say, because I do believe that everybody enjoy good design. Okay. I think that is a very important part, and you probably see that in IKEA as well, that yeah. is a Scandinavian brand, and have a similar kind of idea to, to bring, bring design to the masses. Yeah. Uh, I quite, um, I'm going to quite use this word called democratic design, which mm. I picked up from uh, this context. Um, a lot of, uh, I think because of the economics that the way the world is moving and uh, uh, we used to initially see a lot of EBO's exclusive brand outlets happening, but now everything is a multi-brand outlet. Uh, so a lot of cross-culture I see in the stores now uh, because uh, I'm coming to my original question here because the color is something which like fantasizes all of us here, uh, though it looks simple, but it is not. I really want to understand when you thought about uh, uh, you, you know, uh, 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 of all black, uh, all black smartphone market. Uh, I think that if if I if I think and I go back to those times and try to say all black, uh, it 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 is quite a jerk when you when you when you probably uh, nominate some colors when you nominate certain or probably I would say uh, suggestions which are uh highly aggressive in nature because nobody is doing that for uh, for first of instance and when you bring those there's a lot of pushback that you receive from a lot of people and definitely convincing them and probably taking your thought ahead and moving say look uh this is going to be a success story that's what my hunch is yeah you see that uh, you know how probably if you uh, probably i'm sure you have seen it but then how you tackle it uh, uh when we when we talk about the resistance part of doing something radically different yeah of course it's always uh, resistant and i i think the problem with us is with us human you know we know what we know we don't know what will happen in the future and i i think that's why in working with colors is a good way of working with it in the sense that you you use it more in a scientific way try to understand the underlying behavior and even the unconscious things that we people are looking for and um, and in that sense it's it's easier to explain why you need to go a certain way uh, i have to say myself that i've been working with color and in design industry very much driven by intuition and uh, a lot of uh, just very uh, determined <laughs> to get things in the way i think that things are going but when you have a more sense of um, um, science behind and reason why certain things are like they are, and we looking back to our biological heritage, uh, which you can when it comes to color, then it's much more easier to sell in. Um, and I, I think that that is easier. Uh, but a lot of things that I, I did during my time you know, with um, Nokia, for example, was very much intuition, which designers have. The, the challenge is that it is to make that people believe, especially when you talk about high bosses, they're going to put a lot of money behind your feelings, <laughs> as they say. So, Grace, uh Maybe I'm so sorry. I'm out of curiosity. I'm asking this question to you in a lot more, a deeper way. If I turn back to the time when uh, you know Nokia and Microsoft collaboration happened, uh, and you know uh, what went in your, how probably you drowned to the story of getting to that proposing an idea of black. What went oh. in your mind? How did how did you reach through some kind of a sequencing thought process? That, okay, this may. Uh, have reached you and therefore you have a belief that it is the success of tomorrow uh, how that did translate you mean when, when one one color goes into another color yeah 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 i i think that sometimes especially you have to think about the whole world around um, the retail space the color what people are looking for i i think my biggest role coming into Nokia was because I was coming from the fashion world. So I saw that products overall need to be much more in the sense that they relate to people and people's behavior and what people are looking for. So more towards the fashion statement, but I think fashion statements 
can be too much. You know, you have to think a bit longer term. But uh, so, so actually, uh, I'm not sure exactly when you say black, because when I was coming to the market very early on, the phone wasn't black, it was mostly silver. And I was part of introducing black <laughs> because of the, the fashion direction. And, and, and when they, that finally happened, um, people were like, why do you want to do that? It's, it's the most basic plastic anybody could do. Why do you want to, to go that direction? But in that sense, we were playing a much of fashion, of, of the, the fashion sense of, of using black to have it more in the quality also very much more luxurious. So, so that's why we, we pushed it that direction. And then we were very difficult to get rid of it, actually. Uh, it just completely took over. So everything was black. But I, I, I think also it is, is also belong to the, the whole thing that the phone suddenly become a screen and then you have a black part of the product of the world. So you need to deal with that as well, how that harmonize with the rest. But I, I think I remember then when we changed to white and wanted to have more white, it was really, really difficult because then people only thought it could be this color. And yeah. we introduced color again because for for consumer coming into the store, everything was black. You, can't, you couldn't see what brand it was, what was it different, what was which brand. Everything looked exactly the same. And I think then we decided now we need to push really strongly color again and also the confidence of, of that back yeah. into the market. And I think that was a quite brave move when the market was very nervous at that time to, to do such a thing and having people think about that they suddenly would like to have a yellow phone. <laughs> but the interesting with yellow and color. It's a very emotional, very highly emotional effect on you. So I could clearly see after we introduced that, that the discussion wasn't anymore about technology, it was actually if a person would like to have a yellow phone or not. So that's interesting. Mm. It has this emotional connection to us, color. That I uh, really noticed that uh, I think uh, colors that uh, have their names like apricot, and all that things that also creates a certain kind of emotion to that colors and attach a certain kind of emotions. So I really want to know that how you decide certain names for certain colors, like because there will be a there should be a, some kind of story behind that deciding a color, color name. And Actually, this is also very much depending on how you are as a company. Because it's very easy to sit around in the UK or any kind of country and then you come up with something fantastic name on color. But when you work globally, that name could be something that is not so exciting or doesn't mean the same thing in another country. Yeah. So you have to be very careful. I think many times we went back actually to very simplify color uh, names in terms of just red. <laughs> blue, green, uh, just because that uh, was easier for people when you work globally to understand. If you start to say that something is, is a mushroom color, you could imagine <laughs> we have all kind of different ideas of a mushroom. Uh, so it could be good, it could be very bad as well. So, and then also when you work for big companies, you have a lot of lawyers that have to deal with things. What actually names are allowed to be called certain thing. We, I remember we had some problems working with operators in the US that certain colors were collect, were, were belong to certain brands. So you were not allowed to use that. So naming is, is a difficult one. And, I think what we normally do, if you want to go out and, and play up the naming of color, you need to work very, very strongly with marketing. Mm. That would be my recommendation. Right. Uh, oh, and, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, when we sit in global markets, uh, my experience says that uh, the people who buy our products, are sitting in different corners of the world. Their culture, their, their food, their things are fairly different. And therefore, understanding those consumer insights and putting 
thoughts together as a designer and say this or that would click or that this won't click. I'm actually putting my neck on sword, literally. And again, coming back to your uh, uh, thoughts where you uh, have this uniqueness and the courage to go and take those decisions where, you know, in today's designers, because uh, uh, I see a lot many times when a client pushes you beyond, beyond a point, you say, yes, sir, I need money. I'll, I'll say your boss is right. But actually being a designer and, and having that responsibility that you want to park something unique to the world and which is going to be beneficial for the business as well. Uh, what you what what is that strategy that you would want to impart to today's designers? I would say the responsible designers of tomorrow. How and what they should connect when it comes to consumer insights globally? Yeah, I think when we talk about color again and the effect of color, for example, um, some years ago I was working with a client that needed help, not only with the product design and branding, but also with the color and material selection for one of the stands in the CES, you know, the consumer technology industry, the big, big fair in Las Vegas. And since we already had used apply color psychology for the product and brand strategy, now was the time to make that work for the space design in terms of very important product stand and showcase that product. So the color scheme that we were using uh, was well harmonized. And, and that, again, is a, is a really important part to understand how color harmonized to to have a very very strong communication characteristic uh, and 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 with that in this case we were using something that would look very aspirational and very high tech and that was part of the scheme because this was a startup uh, mm -hmm. in the health area and they want the color to also have that kind of feel but the interesting thing was that different color have have different impacts. So, um, so when selecting the color, quite often uh, it may be very random. Uh, some come up with color they just like, something familiar, or sometimes they want to use the brand itself, and without considering or understanding the physiological and the psychological factors that the, if in terms of the, the emotional and the consumer behavior. So my question to them was, how do you want people to feel seeing your stand from far mm -hmm. or entering into your stand? Mm -hmm. if, if you ever have been to these sort of big shows, you will walk and walk and walk for hours and you're quite exhausted and you know your energy is, is low. So there are question we need to consider when we're creating this sort of application uh, we think about the space design wouldn't we want to create something that they will see from far you know or something they will come into and they will actually be filled of energy when they do you know so you think from that point of view <laughs> and, and when i talked about it that way i did not have a problem to sell in the the color because it wasn't anymore about oh do you like blue or not or or actually my uh, person i know or they used blue before it wasn't about that it was more about how do you want people to feel yeah very true grace i think how you want people to feel about your product is that's precisely the context of the matter yeah but sometimes people go wrong uh, um, i'm purely talking about my experience uh where i have seen while you're devising a storyline or while you're devising a strategy uh, for a particular market, and if you know that your client is not very strong in that market, uh, you barely have a survival strategy. The brand always wants to be, uh, you know, play safe, do not go overboard, look, do's and don'ts, stuff like that. Yeah. Same time, uh, you need to have a highly competitive strategy. For example, for sure, mm -hmm. maybe I'm just giving an out of context example, maybe something from your industry. iPhone as a product never ever, uh, you know, uh, uh, leaves hands of their own customers. They somehow attach their own customer and they, 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 the kind of loyalty that we have seen uh, in different uh, parts of the world for iPhones 
is it's been increasing uh, the in, in terms of relationship to a next level whereas if i look at uh, other brands they have got a different neck of a strategy in terms of the new features they want to put in new colors they want to put in new finish they want to put in Pre precisely i'm talking about talking about cmf yeah now in this context the designers of today because now uh, as we do the retail stores the 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 the, the, the stores designs are also kind of impacted largely because of the product feel itself so uh very lately i have also started noticing that the way the samsung stores and apple stores are in terms of look they're, they're getting very closer in terms of the way even they look and then the, inter the interfaces of smart tables and stuff like that any opinions that you have in terms of how a designer would ensure that the competitiveness uh, across different markets could be of some level when the design is put across their thought they say okay fine you're safe come on pick up these three parameters or pick up those two parameters you can be still safe i think it's first of all it's whatever we do we we need to to create something that uh, it, when you create a brand for for example it's um, the successful brand is important to envision your brand as as a person and and with that i think we can't go out and and change too dramatically but you could change within what that personality type is because also if you change too much or you try to be everything for everybody nobody would recognize who you are and i think a problem what happened with nokia actually at some point was that they tried to be everything for everybody you know they have everything and and it become difficult to recognize who they were I think Apple have been quite strong to keep a very clear line of who they are and and people appreciate that uh, as well uh, and and of course in that said it's easy that people get too boring and they not change enough and and so on but I I think also that many times company doesn't spend enough time to really think about what brand personality they are and uh, i i think that is a lot we can learn from psychology overall you have um, psychiatrist for example carl jung he he was very good at understanding the market how different uh, personality types exist and uh, with that we could explain and draw on what who are we trying to do things for and what do we need to um, portray ourselves to be successful and again it's difficult but the more you have uh, of a certain science behind it helps to make this decision happen but i i know when the market is is nervous it's always very easy that we don't do anything and in that sense we would not be successful either yeah i think do you uh, understand what i mean with yeah, yeah, uh, i i could i could i could strong. relate to, i yeah. could relate to yeah it's great though it is uh, the things that you just touched upon they uh, are like something which is like more of uh, r and d for that particular market uh, but then the challenge which uh, we face as designers mm -hmm. uh, there is always something called uh, your your hunch your gut feel uh, yeah intuition yeah yeah the intuitional part and, and i think your intuition drives you somehow and brings a faith or a belief which lets you convert or maybe convince people to an extent that look this is something please trust me this will happen give me so a lot many times i've i've seen uh when you go with that hunch i'm sure this purely not hunch it's it, it's logically driven with data your your own insights and everything put together but yes mostly if you do not have this hunch if your intuition does not matches what what the numbers are <laughs> client is uh, 
uh, is not trained to take that risk. For example, I have a client or a very different client. They are in the uh, they are in the they are in the uh, 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 fishing segment of uh, uh, they are one of the largest expo exporter of uh, uh, seafood uh, uh, exports. Yeah, and they have about some twelve colors inside the store because wow. the the product is coated with color, and they were very persistent that use twelve colors inside the store. Mm -hmm. And but do you know the reason why? Do they have because, any sort of reason? Yeah, yeah, because their their products are so iconic. Mm -hmm. Like Maggie's yellow and stuff like that. This is so iconic in their own segment. They really don't mm -hmm. want to kind of shuffle that piece. Mm -hmm. said, all colors is mandatory for a store design. Yeah. As a designer, we took a stand that look, all colors is too much inside a store. Actually, you're making a kidsy schools for the infants. And, wow. you know, so we, we took a stand. I'm giving a very live example, uh, so to say. No, I think that is a good example. But I, I think that, again, they just think that they have certain color that represent the brand, and that is really important for them. If they're going to apply that, the application of that is really important that that gets right. So uh, what they don't know is what happens to people if you take certain color and put them in certain places. For example, if I would say red. So if you use red, red is really important for them. It have to be there. And you would put that into the <coughs> ceiling. You know, that could be very... It will actually make the ceiling come down because red makes the feeling of that it's closer than other colors depends on the wavelengths that actually that colors is projected to us yeah or otherwise it would be intruding for example there many things that they don't know about the only thing they think make sure that our brand colors is visible but as a designer we have to to solve that wish they don't want to lose it because they are afraid that people would not recognize who they are that's fine. But how you apply it, we could do that very scientifically and say, you know, this is very important that you have the right background behind your product, otherwise they will not be visible. And you could explain that in a more scientific way. And then you could choose a certain area where these colors that they is very important for them are displayed, but in a in an organized way. So it's not taken away from them. But it's just how you design around it so it come back in a way that you could prove that this would actually be better. And because I mean colors is strong in the sense that you could even you could even have have people feel if a room is cold or, or warm, depends on if you're using warm colors or cool colors. So so there are many of these more scientific things that I see helpful and I have used in in my discussions with a client and I've been surprised that they actually changed because just saying, I believe this is right. It's not enough. Uh, definitely not when you're dealing with people that, that I just also feel that that is not what they feel is right. Very true. Very true. Agree somehow the things that you're saying, I remember a lot of my business deals, <laughs> getting captured as a moment it's somewhere in my brain so a uh, very insightful discussion indeed i'm i'm really uh, you know getting uh, the joy of talking with you today uh yeah. it, talks I think it's a lot, it is a lot of support you know and i i think companies could think about that as well to utilize expert in certain area yeah. and get this feedback and that will help so much for designers actually to don't have to have these fights where you say, I believe this or I believe that. And, you know, I have had sometimes people have said when I talk to CEOs, but my wife's name polish is this color. That's why we're going to have it, you know. <laughs> I understand that, but let's take it on a scientific level now. Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and many times colors are need to be used 
very functional and that's why it's important to understand the scientific side of it because you you could play up or play down so many things and for example when you look at the the, the basic colors um with um, psycho psychological effects on us is as you know for blue is something that um, will evoke our in, uh, intellect so if you want people to to think and you know observe and and have the the function of the intellect then, then it's always good to have those colors so you can really play or if you want things to be more trustworthy you would use such a color uh, if you want to have the pulse really up upbeat and you would feel like you know then you would have red and, and those kind of colors because that's what they do so it's very interesting to see you go into a, a cinema or a concert hall and they have all played red because you were sitting there really sweating yeah. because it's so yeah. intense yeah, yeah. that's what they want Right. So it's it's all about playing out. But I, I think in color stores it's always good also to maybe create this different um harmonized places. So you could play with colours that is harmonizing more yeah. than in different groups. Yeah. Because you have people with different personality types. And I think Jung especially the psychologist he was talking a lot about uh, that we are extrovert introvert for example so extrovert people they have a lot of things going on on the outside and they could be very stimulated that's fine for them introvert person is very sensitive to too much stimulation so for them it needs to be held back a little bit so that's also possible you know in the store like that you could play up an area which you have people that are more extroverted, we love that, you know, but you could also have an area that is, is much more appealing for people that have the other side. And in that side, you need to cleverly make sure that they don't conflict with each other, but they would see that you could maybe go inside an environment that have one or the other to yeah. really play on the different moods right. for people. Something on, Grace, on on strategical design or maybe uh, if I was reading about a strategical collaboration between uh, Nokia and Microsoft, uh, you were there when this uh, thing happened. Uh, I think today's designers, uh, I think you, you have seen the whole fraternity of designers across, across different markets. The growing uh, ask that we see in the recent pace is that the, the designer supposed to think sales and supposed to understand brand strategies and he needs to understand consumers and he needs to understand blah 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 and the story doesn't end and if anything goes wrong call the designer uh what you did guys is not working so i i really want to understand what is the true horizon a designer should think in terms of strategic designs am i what is the best less or a mode or angle that a designer should look at from a perspective. Okay, if I do this, I'm, I, at least I'm safe. Come on. Yeah. I, I think in different companies, designers have different roles. And uh, in very wise companies, they would have designers very close to the top of decision making. Unfortunately, many times, um, it's more of a cosmetic work designers do. They are not part of, of the longer time decision making and they could just do the best they can unfortunately just uh, do the after work <laughs> but i think to be successful it's it's very good to have designers in early on in the process of decision making and i say that also because i've seen so many times that you would just try to do something in the end and that is very simple, that is sometimes even colored. And they say, oh, wow, I just changed the color in there. Can't even understand the supply, I mean, the whole supply chain. What that means, it's 
absolutely catastrophic because I mean even if you want to do material in metal you probably have to go out five years before and decide that that's what you're going to do in some industries so you, you really have to have designers in the in the forefront and then the same thing actually unfortunately is that designers have to be marketing as well because you I don't know how many companies I've been working with that have a complete difference you have one marketing team have no contact with the designer and the designer are building up this amazing understanding of humans and the interaction and everything and the marketing they never reach that story so they make up their own story and they have nothing to do with each other and marketing is super frustrating because they just think i just got this three weeks before launch and i'm going to figure out how on earth i'm going to sell this and and they don't realize how amazing work has been already done because they're not in connection, different offices. And then the designing is really disappointing to say, well, why on earth are they telling that story? It, it, it doesn't connect with people or the research we've done. So I think this is the challenge when it comes to big companies. How do we work in and out in a close relationship and understand? And unfortunately, designers have a really heavy burden because they need to be in between everything. Yeah. I say. And and there are it's some people that have, everything. <laughs> yeah, they could do that less, but maybe they could have a very focused role and then they have a manager that is overlapping all of these things. But you have to because in the end you you are in many times we are the carrier of human connection true 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 and sometimes especially i work with so many scientists and i work with so many um engineers and unfortunately sometimes they are, they are so much more interested that the technology work you know but it works <laughs> and then the designers say but what are you going to use it for why would people not want this well, I don't know, but it's really exciting and it works. <laughs> so, so we are the one that try to make it exciting. And if we don't, it's come out so many amazing innovation, but because they haven't been connected to people and then marketing. And I think a big part why, why Apple becomes so successful, they did marketing. They did amazing marketing, <laughs> amazingly well, yeah. So, I mean, they could go up in the scene and say, you know, this phone can do emails. And I mean, there have been hundred phones before that could do emails, but <laughs> yes. They said it. They thought it could be done. So it's, it's this really work together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, uh, Greece, and I think, you know, uh, while you're talking, you know, I think it's just having goosebumps here because you're touching things where we could see a lot of our uh, uh, experiences in different markets where we have worked in. Mm -hmm. But on the growing front, I think this is a challenge that I notice in most of the global branches that we work with. The designers say that clients are not giving us a time to put up a good show. They need yeah. design tomorrow. They need design tomorrow. And this, this undue ask of time crunch Let's them producing an uh, 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 an output which is not matching to the expectation, and no matter how hard that we try, if we do not have time, and surely this is a common scenario globally, the, the time is never there. No. How have you handled this uh, with, with your uh, expertise and experience? It is very challenging, especially when you work as an agency. Because I worked, you know, in. The corporate world but i also worked as an agency for a long time as well so that's very difficult because it's even difficult in the corporate world as i said to get hold of roadmaps and understanding what they have because sometimes you can even design something and it will never be there because it's not ready it's not something they have bought into and they can't in that time frame. So if you come up with an idea, it would be too late already and we put a lot of effort. So the question is how do we ask the right question from the beginning so you really have a good understanding. And sometimes they refuse to give that out because they think it's too too um, secret or I mean they have to to they are afraid to give things like that out. But I, I think in that sense you have to 
make them understand as well what would be the benefit if you would know certain things in beforehand. If you, for example, are working with some material or if, for example, if you do, a, you know, you're in retail, if you do a certain shop and there is no way they will ever get hold of that sort of material or you know that you cannot, with that time frame, even ask to get that sort of material. These things need to be clear from the beginning and, and they need to understand that if they want certain things, this is how long it will take. And I, I know even my son is working in advertisement and he's doing 3D projects, you know, and, and that's even more complicated. People don't understand that renderings and things like that takes time. It yeah. just not happen like that. Yes. True. So, but but I, I think it's sometimes mm -hmm. we have to spend some time to think about the right questions so they also understand why you need to know certain things and how they will benefit them if we do know those things. And it's, it could also benefit cost a lot, which they may not think about. Yeah. But unfortunately, today it's also a little bit a game because you have different <coughs> kind of fighting to get the job. Yeah. And they would just say, oh, it's okay, it's okay, we, we make it, we make it. And in the end, they will not get what they want anyway. True, 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 true. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> yeah. So it's tricky. I, I think it's difficult when you are in the beginning and you just want to, to, to get the new client but when you work in with a client you work with sometimes then it's a good idea to start to talk about and understand where they could save money and how you could help them because you could show them how they could look further down or seeing the whole production more as a circle instead of something that looks good all the way and then in the end you have to clean up and clean up and it's going to be very expensive for them to actually get it right sure sure uh as a part of uh, a mandate line across different markets that you work in the clients put one line in the briefs they say sustainability has to be the core of it bring yeah. sustainability and the sustainability trust me is such a huge confusion now. I would use the word confusion because the the, the sense of understanding of sustainability, so to say, I, I would say it's a clutter today. Uh, people have so much uh, to speak on this word and literally a uh, very less you see on the ground because a lot of constraints in terms of material supplies, a lot of things that you cannot do, business have to sustain, stuff like that. In an era like this, when when the designers have to ensure that they really need to rise up to the occasion, what are, what are the, some of the few things, simple things uh, that you should bring into our practice to ensure that we actually contribute back to the environment as responsible designers? Uh, what is what is that you feel about it in, in case that you have? I actually did a whole talk on that for Design um, Forum in Finland, but I, I think it's about uh, trying to design in a way, resourceful way. And when you design resourceful, you, you think about how you are utilize things. And, and this has to do again with that you you know from the beginning what you are designing. So for example, if you are doing something with a certain color, and then the, you, this have caused a lot of problem, I have to say, because sometimes, you know, you have a brown color or the color is decided and then they want it in a certain material because the form need to be in a certain material. But they don't find out that that material cannot easily be colored that way. So if you would color it that way, you have to throw away half of all of the pieces you're going to do to create that perfect one. So the yields would be amazing. So that's not a sustainable way. So instead, you should look at, okay, if we want to do it in that form, you have these possibilities. Otherwise, we may have to look at a couple of other materials. So the materials and the colors go hand in hand, they can't be separate. 
And I think that's a problem because you have a designer sitting on and they do their thing, have no clue what kind of material is going to be done. They do it on their 3D, it looks nice, cool, it works. But they don't know that it's going to be done in this material. And if you do that, it's going to cause yields. Yields cost money. It's going to throw away a lot of, of parts. Yeah. So these are small things you can look at to improve. But again, it's it's been part of. I think that's the problem sometimes. Who is who is part of of the team that kicks off the innovation or the product? Who is involved? Do you have the right people involved there that could take the decision all the way down to production? If you don't have, you actually dealing with things you don't know. Sure. And all of these things need to be sorted out later on. Yeah. And then that causes yields, problems, and that causes a lot of other things. Uh, and Chris, maybe uh, one of the things that we saw in, in the recent experiences, anything that you touch upon which is doable, which is uh, something which you see close to reality in terms of even when you design something, you sort of like can get you in this skull and stuff. Like by the time, do you do, you, you, you do your crunching, uh, number crunching the Excel sheets? You realize that this price is shooting up. It can, but it doesn't have to. Because, I mean, again, if you end up with lots of yields, that will cause very expensive. And, and you could have chosen another direction completely if you know what material you could choose from. And also, if you don't know, you, you will just go for, oh, we need to solve this. The designer says it's going to be this thing and that thing, no compromise. And then they try to solve it. Instead of the designer is more informed, they could choose another direction from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Because they have different tools in, in hand. So you're giving the designer more tools to choose from. Yeah. And I think uh, just help me in understanding, will it be a wise strategy to apply? And I think we, we did uh, it in the past. And some of the stances we've, we failed miserably and some of the stances we uh, we realized it was a huge success because <clears throat> when you put across a point of thought which is radically different people tend to say okay this will not work come on think of something else we say okay fine we take a cost it let us develop it let us let us show you the initial prototypes and you see and once it becomes a believable story in a matter of a quarter we have seen that the the, the the nervousness goes away, the yeah. confidence replaces, and then uh, and it causes a response to the volume. And over a time that we see when there were two people supporting, four people more came in, and then four, and the cycle build in. And it's a notion that follows you. Know, you have to build the notion, and I think. But this process is time consuming. Yeah. This process is. Also, that to bring all the frogs in one basket is, is difficult. It's really difficult to tell, yeah. look, this will work. We, we, we have reached to a kind of a partial solution, but it is not full. Will it be right to follow this practice? Or you really think that, you know, the best way is to go from the fundamental stretch things and then only begin with something? I think with everything you have to, to see, you have to have one smaller part that is the risk part where you push the boundaries, where you try with new things, and that's your innovation part. And then you would have to have things that is stable, that is just delivering. And they are a, a, another sort of, um, it's not innovation, but it is continuation. So you improve those. They have smaller changes because, because of all of the production you do, you learn things and you could improve those to be better and better. But then you have these other parts that, that you would try out things and be a bit more brave and learn from that and then implement that again on other things. So it's a very strategic way. I remember when I worked for H&M a long time ago, they always had certain clothes that was very 
you know, out there, even if it's a fashion brand, but they wasn't sure how it's going to sell. So what they did, they just implement that in a couple of, of the biggest store, uh, like City Store, and then try this out. And they saw, and they, they made those products locally, more locally, so they made them in Europe, for example. So it was easy at that time to just order. The ordering time was less. And the big, big volume things they did in Asia because that would take maybe five months to to produce. So then they did that with a stable. So dealing with these two, and immediately we, we always know after three days, we had always this talk together and see how did it sell. So if it picked up after three days, then they renew the order for the big, big, sell because they know it went well so it's very strategic i i think how you build in innovation how do you see as a responsible designer to rise up to such occasions and and do something towards yeah something. Yeah. yeah again i mean you you it's, it's always good to go back and do an analyze how things went and what it is to be learned and then see how you could implement that next time. In some cases, you could actually change and have that possibility to do it differently. But otherwise, you have to go back and, and just learn and, and for the next time. I think if you, if you see the... In the UX and UI world, they work a lot more with very fast that they do prototyping all the time. And, and I think that, again, is coming back to <laughs> the, the product phase as well, that it's more demand on, on doing prototyping to try things on and, and feel how it is. Um, so in some cases, that would be good to have been doing some sort of prototyping. And sometimes you could do it today. I think you could even do it in terms of um, uh, AR as well. So you could have people walk into space and try things out in space, even if it's not built yet. You know, I don't know how much you use that, but, uh, you know, IKEA have that as well, that you could actually take... They have used furniture inside, and I, I know I, I know much more people are using those kind of, of tools. Yeah. So we, 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 we did use all those AI gestures, walls as well, where you can yeah. shop your dresses yeah. and you can have multiple yeah. things. Later that, on, what, that did not yeah. help enough, you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, uh, what we also realized, and I'm just an explanation of what we are discussing right now, we we borrowed a technology uh, for to test it out from somebody and said that you know why don't we create a prototype into kind of a metaverse itself and we started taking our clients to that metaverse space and showing them literally how the design works oh. now what we noticed the client since he's exposed to the entire universe of the store now he himself is a designer, you're not. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He so did. I think <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's easily happened. But I, I think then, again, we need to go back with uh, the science behind design and the reason. I mean, he have obviously no clue what color he would put into that store and how that will affect people or um, how he maybe built, how to build it so people will walk through it easily or not, you know, and why Kia is very good at that. You never get yourself out of their store <laughs> without buying a lot of stuff on the way. But that is very carefully calculated how they have done that. It's not yeah. somebody themselves just sitting and designing their own space, for sure. Sure, sure. So uh, I think there's a lot of, of good evidence there to make them understand that, yes, of course, you could use this and do it yourself, but what what is it that is going to say that you would be able to understand consumer in a more scientific way, mm. uh, to understand their behavior. 
But how and I think today it's happened more and more that, uh, I mean, in our company, we also today have a person that is purely from psychology area and uh, neuroscientist, basically. Oh my, God. oh, my God. Because that's the language you need to use sometimes uh, to, to make people secure that this is how people behave. I think it's, it's, it's really an amazing move, uh, Grace. And I think a person who can talk about neuroscience and stuff like that, like, uh, you really can't beat such people in terms of the moment you start, they start with their vocabs and pointing and framing those conversations in a directional way. Amazingly well, amazingly well. Do you, do you, do you see the similar problems which we just spoke about few of them when you're, when you deal with your clients? Uh, how do you set your expectations in terms of delivery mechanism? Uh, uh, everybody says, when you show me the design, the one thing that I want to say, wow, it's an amazing design. And that wow differs, you know, uh, your, your understanding of that wow, or my understanding or client's understanding of that wow differs. And to an extent, I've, I've learned that art of getting wow from a client, but I know at the end of the day, if the consumer is not giving you sales, it is not a wow design. Yeah. So, at times, you either become a salesperson looking at the business need, either you become an ethical person to say, look, I will not do, come what may. Yeah. You have to choose a role. How should we choose a role of, you know, being into that right perspective? You cannot be somebody who's right or somebody who's kind of a God element in the design always. Uh, how, do you, how do you see with this thing with your experience? I, I think, again, sometimes there are clients that they're going to go the way and um, you are limited what you could deliver, basically, because they're not listening. Uh, but it, it's a lot, many times, of being trust. Of course, the more you have in your book, backbone to make sure that they understand that you know what you're talking about, that is important. Uh, but we, we, we worked with so many clients. I, I, I know also in, in China, we've been working with a lot of clients in China as well, and they may not be so, so familiar with research and these, and they're very much fast. Just do it. <laughs> you don't hear about their research or anything. Just make it happen. <laughs> so, I, so then it is. It is very difficult to to pursue, uh, but again, uh, that will be the many times there was are people copying others that have gone through that process, and then they become successful just because they follow somebody that have done it right. <laughs> but they do it cheaper. <laughs> That's why they do. do That's this. About China. All the clients they come. Okay, give me something that's cheaper. Give me something that's cheaper. And that's the biggest word they use in most of the discussions when they come across. Uh, uh, so, uh, so Grace, I think, you know, we have taken a lot of your time today. Uh, before I before I end up asking one of the most uh, burning questions of the audience here. Uh, your work is a legacy in the market today. And I, with due respect, and we all look forward to have similar contributions of the size that you have made. They have given me a written note by the time I was speaking to you. Anything that you have to say to the young designers, how they should do it. Uh, I've got my designers from New York on this call. Uh, she's listening to us and I've got somebody from Vietnam and different countries. I said, do you have one thing in common that you really want to tell us that, you know, uh, all my Indian designers are here. They, they, they have one thing in common to say that what is the yardstick they use in this coming year to emerge as a great designer? At the same time, they become the superheroes of the clients. I think it's important that we never lose our interest in people and amazed how we work. And uh, I, I, I also think we shouldn't limit ourselves in terms of what we can design because I mean for me I'm coming from the fashion industry straight into technology and end up in innovation with Microsoft so the, the way we think 
as a designer is is that we could deal with many complex problems at the same time. And I think we should remember that. But of course, we shouldn't stretch ourselves too much. So we feel that we need to be everywhere, which is tempting as a designer, and we are very curious. But uh, I, I think it's, it's good to remember that we shouldn't be afraid to, to voice things that we see is important. The only thing that is important, we need to make sure that we're not only talking about feeling, we need to back it up with science and, 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 and proper material behind us because, because of that, we could do things and get through things in an amazing way, I have to say, rather than we are thinking that people think like us because they many times don't and we have to also we um, have empathy and think that people have put a lot of money behind our ideas <laughs> and we need to make sure that they feel safe as well when they are going to put that much money behind but i i think we have a very special role because many times we see through so many stages and we feel so uh, passionate about the products and the concept we do because we we are the one that sees it from the beginning and many times follow it all the way through and we are the one that's waiting to see how consumer will react we are very excited about that so many times other people you know uh, in the company may only have smaller parts to play yeah yeah uh so uh, before uh, we list three towards to the last stage of this podcast, any anything that you want to say, how you felt while talking to us, anything that you have in particular to say to us uh, as, as as few words of. Well, I'm I'm very excited to hear that you you have uh, the wish to do new and exciting things because that is so important. And if we remember. There is nobody in the whole world that haven't had problems trying to do things. But if you succeed, you know, that would be, you know, that is where everybody going to look at. And that would be standard for many others to follow. But it's not easy to go that route for anybody. And we shouldn't fool ourselves to think that that is easy. But if we succeed, then you're going to be legendary in the sense that people will see wow, they actually solved that. But we need to be aware of how we take risk and not right. do it with everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I personally felt amazing, Grace. I've, I've, had a, I've had a chance to speak uh, with a lot of people in my career too. But I think uh, one thing that I've seen, Grace, that you know, the moment you spark the conversation, uh, it, I could see answers even before you could speak, you know, I think, you know, that, that, that thing only emerges when you have a tremendous experience backed a lot of situations that we have seen, uh, just having 15, 20 year, 30 year experience does not build what you are, but I think how you responded to those years makes who you are. And I think, you know, some of the learnings that I have taken personally on this call from you, um, we're going to have that impact from tomorrow on all the workings uh, globally, wherever we work. And uh, we look forward, not for just this is the end of the call, but we really look forward to have a similar line of thought discussions and maybe a working relations in the time to come somehow, if possible, to see that how we can navigate through uh, uh, a common learning process, uh, 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 which can go on ever. Yeah, I think also something that it's good to think about this mentorship, you know, and that is because even if you have experience for a little bit different design areas, um, the, the design process and many of these learnings is quite similar, actually. Yeah. Uh, and I noticed that more and more. I, I know people working only with UX and they say, oh, this is a new process. And then when you've been in design for a long time, you look at it and say, yeah, that's, that is a design process. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so it, is, it is similar. 
Uh, but definitely, I, I think what uh, we are starting up a company in, in Sweden now. And as I was saying, we're also adding on uh, a person that will drive more of this deeper understanding in human behavior as well. And um, we would probably do much more mentoring yeah. in terms of really support designers because the designers know their personal problems. Yeah. best but they may not always know uh because there's also a lot of young people out now which is really good yeah. but they it's good for them to have some mentoring and, and have some support just to see things a bit different and what kind of question could they ask what kind of processes is it's good to think about yeah strengthen them yeah. I'm sure uh, we will be in touch as always and uh, uh, we have a uh, lot of things and, and I just remember the mentoring thing is something that we're going to pick up very seriously and if there's some way that you want to tell us that we if there's any way that we can pick it up uh, we will surely be very keen in fact if there's some way that we can pick up on mentoring piece yeah. Yeah. thank you so much billion thanks to you Grace for thank this you. amazing talk today Looking forward uh, in times to come and meet with you in person. Yeah, I have a great passion for designers, so that's oh. very thank important. you, thank you, Chris. thank you, thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Take Bye-bye. care. Take care.